Hey guys, Miss Miklos here with our Chapter 5 review. And the first few problems we're going to go through are similar to what you're going to see at the very beginning of the test. So it's just telling us to solve, and I notice that we have a quadratic function. We know that there are four different methods in which we could use to solve. And I know looking at these methods, factoring and square roots are probably the two easiest methods, but they don't always work. I know completing the square and quadratic formula always work, um, but I would try and see if we can factor a problem like this first. I know I can't square root it because I have an x squared and an x, so that's not going to work. So when we talked about factoring, I told you guys a way to check if something is factorable when we have a leading coefficient is to multiply that by the constant. So 5 times 6 is 30 and figure out are there any factors of 30 that add up to be negative 13. And negative 10 and negative 3 work, so that tells me it's factorable. So I'm going to go ahead and use opposite of FOIL, and I'm going to get 5x and x. And I know my, my options for 6 are going to be negative 1 and negative 6, or negative 2 and negative 3. So I'm going to try minus 3 and minus 2, and let's double check with inside and outside negative 10x minus 3x is negative 13x. So that works, and I'm going to set these both equal to 0. So I get x is equal, or I should say 5x equals 3, so x is 3 fifths, and then x is equal to 2. It should make sense to me that we have two different solutions because this is a quadratic function. And I would get these two, these two exact same answers even if I used a different method like completing the square and quadratic formula. It would probably just cause me a little bit more work as I had to try and simplify the answers. Number two looks really painful because we see these fractions. So I'm actually going to begin by multiplying everything by the least common denominator. Notice I'm doing this before I even determine what method to use. So when I distribute, my 10s cancel out and I just have s plus 1 squared. When I distribute um, to the negative 12 over 5, I get negative 24. And when I distribute to 15 over 2, I end up getting 75. Now to me, this looks like a method that I would use square roots on because I don't see just a plain s hanging out. I have this squared term and I have numbers. So I'm going to isolate whatever's being squared first. So I'm going to add 24 over. Then I know I need to square root both sides and I need to put plus or minus in front of the radical. So I get s plus 1 equals plus or minus. When I simplify 99, that would be 9 times 11 or 3 times 3 times 11. So I'm going to take out that pair of 3's and leave the 11 inside. And I get s equals negative 1 plus or minus 3 radical 11. Okay, so once again, if I have fractions, I would multiply by the LCD to get rid of them. If I have a term squared and just constants, or if I had a coefficient out here, I would solve by square rooting. I think it's the easiest way to go about a problem like this. Okay, number three. First thing I would look to see, can we factor? And there's no factors of three that add up to be six. I also cannot use square roots because I have this x squared and I have an x, so it doesn't work. So I'm going to use completing the square. When we're completing the square, the first thing I do is move my constant over to the other side. Now I'm going to divide everything by our leading coefficient, which is 1, so that really doesn't affect anything. Then to create a perfect square trinomial, I'm taking this middle term, which is 6, and I'm going to divide it by 2 and square it. So I'm adding 9, and that means I also need to add 9 to the other side. This factors into a binomial squared, and we learned that this term here is always half that middle coefficient, so I get the quantity x plus 3 squared equals 6. When I square root both sides now, I'm putting plus or minus out in front, and I get x plus 3 equals plus or minus radical 6. 
So x is equal to negative 3 plus or minus radical 6. We also could have used quadratic formula on this problem and we would get the same exact answer. Okay, so number 4, um, if I do 5 times 13, I kind of see that this is not going to work. So I'm either going to have to use completing the square or quadratic formula. And I'm going to use quadratic formula here just to remind us all how to do that. And before we do that, I'm actually going to show us why a quadratic formula works. So if I had ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0, this is our general um, equation. If I'm trying to complete the square, first thing I do is I move my constant over to the other side. Then I divide everything by the leading coefficient. To figure out what I'm adding here to create a perfect square trinomial, I'm taking which is b over a, and I'm dividing that by 2. There we go. I know dividing by 2 is the same thing as multiplying by 1 half. So I get b over 2a, and then I need to square that, so I get plus b squared over 4a squared. So I'm going to add b squared over 4a squared to both sides. When I factor this, it becomes x plus b over 2a squared, because I know this is always half that middle coefficient, equals, um, to get a common denominator, I would need to multiply that first term by 4a over, 4, over 4a, and so I get b squared minus 4ac over 4a squared. Now when I square root both sides, I get x plus b over 2a equals the square root of b squared minus 4ac, and I should put plus or minus out in front, over the square root of 4a squared. And I'm going to do two things at once here. I'm going to subtract negative b over 2a. I also know that the square root of 4a squared is 2a. And this magically becomes our quadratic formula. And you guys did not have to do this, but I just figured I should show you where this comes from in case that ever comes up again. It's not going to be on our test. Now we're just going to go back to number four and actually use this formula. Okay, so our A value is 5, our B value is 6, our C value is 13. So X equals the opposite of B plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. So I get negative 6 plus or minus the square root of 36 minus 260 over 10, which is negative 6 plus or minus the square root of negative 224 over 10. And all of a sudden, when I see negative 224, I know we have to do two different things here. First of all, I'm going to have to take out an i. I also am going to have to deal with 224. And if I do a factor tree of 224, that is 4 times 56, so I get 2 times 2 times 8 times 7. I know 8 is 2 times 2 times 2. So I have these two different pairs we can take out. So I would make that 4i radical 14 because 2 times 7 is left over, over 10. Now finally, I need to split this up. So I'm going to make it negative 3 fifths plus or minus 2i radical 14 over 5. And if you guys wrote this as 2 radical 14i, that would be completely fine as well. Okay, so here is an example of what we would need to do in order to use quadratic formula. Okay, so next concept I want to talk about are complex numbers. And these first four are things that we need to have memorized. We need to know that i to the first is i. Or we can also write that as the square root of negative 1. i squared is negative 1, i cubed is negative i, and i to the fourth is 1. 
So these are just me things that we need to have memorized. Now we will also have some stuff like this on our test. And remember, we're going to take that exponent and divide by 4. The reason why we're using 4 is because we notice that this pattern repeats every 4 numbers. So I know 4 goes into 5 one time. When I do 1 times 4, I get, I get 4. 5 minus 4 is 1, and I bring down my 7. 4 goes into 17 4 times. So 4 times 4 is 16, and when I subtract 1, this is my remainder. And remember, that becomes my new exponent. So I would say i to the first here is just i. Kind of a key thing we also talked about is the fact that anything to the 0 power is 1. So if that comes up, we know that our answer should be 1. Okay, so the other thing that we talked about with complex numbers is writing in standard form, which was a plus bi, which meant my real part and my imaginary part. So if we look at negative 5 over 2 minus i, I know this is not okay because we cannot have an imaginary value in our denominator because it represents a square root. So this is when we multiplied by what we called the complex conjugate, which meant my same two terms, I just switched the sign in between. So I get negative 10 minus 5i over 4 plus 2i minus 2i minus i squared. So when I simplify these, I notice my inside and outside terms cancel out. We know i squared is just negative 1, so I have negative 10 minus 5i over 5. So now I need to simplify this. Negative 10 divided by 5 is negative 2. Negative 5i divided by 5 is negative i. So negative 2 minus i would be our final answer. Okay, here's another write in standard form, and I think what makes this one tough is the very first thing that I should do is take an i out. I am also rewriting this because I know something squared means I'm multiplying it by itself. So now I'm going to FOIL, so I get 4 plus 2i radical 3 plus 2i radical 3 plus 3i squared. So when I add my like terms together, I get 4i radical 3, and I know this is like 3 times negative 1. So I have 4 plus 4i radical 3 minus 3, which becomes 1 plus 4i radical 3. Remember, we could also write it 4 radical 3i. So both of these answers would be completely correct. I just need to make sure that my i is not underneath my radical. Here's the final standard form one we're going to do. And the trick on this is I need to distribute that negative, so I get plus 2 minus 4i. Now I'm just adding my like terms together, and I get 6 plus 3i as my answer. Moving along, our next concept is the discriminant. And we went through this in class, and we said when the discriminant is positive, that means that we have two real solutions. When it is equal to 1, we have one real solution. And when it is less than 0, we have two imaginary solutions. So let's actually determine the number and type of roots here. So I know my a is 8, my b is negative 12, and my c is 9 halves. So I'm going to do b squared minus 4ac. Negative 12 squared minus 4 times 8 times 9 over 2. I end up getting 144 minus 144, which is 0. So that means my answer is 1 real. And remember that we don't really care that much about this value. What we care about is this answer. This value just tells me what type of solutions we're going to have. Our next concept, we're just moving right along here, is graphing. This one is lovely because it is in the correct form. So the first thing I'm going to do is list my four characteristics. My vertex here would be 2, 0 because I'm taking the opposite of this number as my x value. I don't have anything, I don't have a k value, so that's where 0 comes from. 
Since our a value is negative one-fifth, I know this is going down. I also know that it is fatty. And lastly, my line of symmetry is x equals 2. So when I'm graphing this, I'm going to go to 2, 0. Since it's down and fat, I'm just going to go down 1 and over 2 in both directions. And then I'm going to sketch my line of symmetry. It's really important that we have all four characteristics and the sketch of our graph in order to receive full credit. This time, my equation is not in the proper form. So I'm going to have to go ahead and use complete this, completing the square to get this in the right form. So I'm bumping over my 5. Then I'm factoring out my leading coefficient, which was 2. To figure out what to add here, I'm taking my middle coefficient, which is 3. I'm going to divide it by 2 and square it. So I'm adding 9 fourths. Now I know that I need to balance that, so I need to multiply 2 by 9 fourths is 18 over 4 or 9 over 2, so that's actually what I need to add to the other side. So I need to remember to always distribute whatever this leading coefficient is. When I factor this, I know it's going to be x plus 3 halves squared, and I know 5 is like 10 over 2. So when I subtract 9 halves from both sides, I get plus 1 half. So my vertex here would be negative 3 halves 1 half. This would be going up. And it is skinny because our a value is 2. And the line of symmetry would be x equals negative 3 halves. So when I'm graphing this, I'm going over 1.5 and up 1 half. Since it's up and skinny, I'm going to go up 2 and over 1 in both directions. And then I'm going to sketch my line of symmetry. It's a lovely straight line by me right there. So um, if you guys need more practice, you guys have all those worksheets that deal with graphing. I would definitely suggest that you go back and redo some of those problems. And lastly, I want to go through a modeling problem. So it says, find the right triangle of the largest area such that the sum of the lengths of its legs is 16 centimeters. Find all three sides. So I'm going to start here by drawing out a picture. And I know if one leg is x, the other one has to be 16 minus x because I know the sum of the lengths is 16. We're trying to find the largest area, so I'm going to do f of x equals, and I know the area formula is 1 half base times height. So when I distribute, I get 8x minus 1 half x squared. And I'm probably going to change the order there just so it's easier for us to see. So I have negative 1 half x squared plus 8x. So, I know that the vertex is negative b over 2a. So, I'm going to do the opposite of 8 over 2 times negative 1 half, which ends up being 8. So, I know that the first side is going to be 8 centimeters. My second side here, 16 minus x, is also going to be 8 centimeters because 16 minus 8 is 8. To find the third side, I would need to use the lovely Pythagorean theorem, and I end up getting 128 equals c squared. So I end up getting, I have no clue why I just wrote a 6 there, I end up getting 8 radical 2 equals our third side. So these would be the three sides now. We know f of x represents the area, so instead of saying find all three sides, if it said find the maximum area, what I would need to do as soon as I knew 8 is to substitute it back into this function to figure out, well, what is the area if x is equal to 8? So hopefully this gives you a good idea of the types of concepts that are going to be on our test, 
and just allows you to prepare for them accordingly. So good luck. If you have questions, please come see me, email me, or whatever's easiest for you. Okay, bye.